Today on Twin Cam, the third and final part of our look around the Lancaster Insurance Classic Motor Show at the NEC in Birmingham. In the last two videos, we've covered halls four and eight, as well as a smattering of the cars from the other halls. And if you didn't catch either of those videos, then I'll put a card in the corner to part two and links in the description to both the other videos. Today we're finishing a look around the rest of the halls, starting on the pride of ownership with this 1975 Volkswagen Golf. We'll get to the modifications in a moment, but for now, let's just take in not only how incredibly well preserved this Golf is, especially considering the rate at which these cars deteriorate, but also the spec of this particular one. In the case of the Mark I Golf, I much prefer a non-GTI, as I feel it brings out the simplicity and crispness of Giugiaro's design, and in a colour like this, expresses its era so brilliantly. The owner, in preserving such an immaculate example of one of history's most important cars, has made this example his perfect compromise between originality and individuality. While maintaining a completely standard appearance, it has an uprated engine with twin carburettors and the more obvious air suspension. I've seen this car on several occasions, but I hadn't ever read its blurb until now, so when I saw it slam to the ground I was a little taken back. That's the benefit of adjustable suspension. At the flick of a switch you can move between slammed and standard. I love that. Giugiaro's boxy and straight edge designs are some of my favourites, and a couple of holes down is another example of this philosophy in an economy car, this 1995 Fiat Panda. The first generation Panda is among my favourite examples of genuinely utilitarian car design. Pandas have everything you need and nothing that you don't. It's for this reason that I'm intrigued by this example. First of all, it's from 1995, the final year the OG Panda was available in the UK, by which point the likes of the Cinquecento were available. So the original owner of this car must have wanted a Panda specifically, and I salute that decision. Thanks not only to the car's simplicity, but the fact that it had already been about for 15 years before 1995. Secondly, I was chatting to the owner of the next car we're going to look at, who explained that the original owner of this car kept it until she gave up driving only a few years ago, at the age of 99. That is dedication. A rather different flavour of small Fiat just across the stand is this 1979 Fiat 127 Sport. This car is one that I feel should be shouted about from the rooftops, as it's this car's recipe that Volkswagen copied to produce the original Golf like the one we've already looked at. As such, this car deserves a fair chunk of the credit for popularising the accepted modern layout for small cars, with a transverse engine, a gearbox on its end, front wheel drive and a hatchback. It may have been BMC that first went all in on these ideas, but it took the Fiat Group, with Auto Bianchi initially, to take the concept to the next level and cement the format. A few stands across, still in the little Fiat section of the Italian corner of Hall 5, is the Panda's spicy grandfather, this 1967 Fiat Abarth 595 SS. This car has been restored and upgraded to a Bath spec with painstaking accuracy by its owner, who I was lucky enough to chat to for a few minutes. Apart from encouraging me to buy myself a 500, he talked about how he sourced all the information about every Bath specific component and its impact, as well as the exact placement of the decals and badges on the bodywork, for which he had to drill 62 holes in the bodywork for. All I can say is that it's a credit to his dedication. Our final Fiat is back over on the stand with the Panda and 127, and it's this 1984 Fiat Argenta. This car caught my eye, as any Argenta, never mind a Mark II, is incredibly rare in the UK. In fact, the Fiat Club knows only of two Argentas on the road, this being one of them. The facelifted car came along in 1983, and it never became available in the UK. Sales of the original were so low that Fiat UK still had stocks of the original, and this one has in fact been imported from Ireland. I don't know why, but I'm happy it's here. 
The Argenta was Fiat's executive car launched in 1981, but it was really just a heavy facelift of the existing Fiat 132, a car that dated back to 1972. While they undoubtedly did a great job of keeping the car feeling somewhat up to date, there was no hiding the real age of the car. An Italian car remembered maybe just a little better than the Argenta is this gorgeous little 1983 Alpha Sud Ti Cloverleaf. The Alpha Sud is among my favourite, and I'm sure that's everyone's favourite, small cars of all time. They are joyful in every sense, from the stylish, sporting, but also compact and cute bodywork, through the tones of the flat 4 engine, to the exceptional suspension. The Alpha Sud's rarity is among its biggest problems, as if they were numerous, I'm sure every other car enthusiast would have one. It's also proof that rust does not make a car bad. That's just an argument of the dim-witted. This being a quadrifolio, it has a 1500cc boxer with twin carburettors producing 105 brake horsepower, putting it amongst the central players of the first generation of hot hatches, including the Mark I Golf GTI. More four-leaf clovers coming up as we're heading into Hall 1 and the Alfa Romeo Owners Club with this Alphaholics GTAR 290. I'm sure by this point that everybody knows who Alphaholics are, but if you don't, they're a tuning and restoration company based near Bristol that builds amazing resto mods like this, based on an original 105 series Julia Sprint. Unfortunately, I somehow managed to lose a few shots of this car, so apologies for the lack of wide shots, but I am a firm believer that these are the most beautiful cars of all time. Nothing can beat the flowing lines of these alphas that make them appear to be moving quickly, even when stationary. They are exceptionally elegant at the same time, with minimal fuss and features like these exquisitely simple door handles. The GTAR 290 is completely revised over a standard car, featuring a 2300cc twin spark engine with fuel injection, producing 240 brake horsepower at 7000 rpm. On its end, a close ratio 5 speed gearbox, a lightweight prop shaft, and an LSD. Holding it to the road are titanium bushes, billet uprights, adjustable dampers, and a whole load of aluminium suspension componentry. Making it stop are billet 6 pot front calipers covering 300mm discs and 2 pot calipers with 267mm discs at the back. This recipe is housed in a seam welded body with lightweight glass and carbon fibre doors, bonnet and boot, totalling a curb weight of only 830 kilograms. This is pure, unadulterated automotive perfection. Behind the GTAR are a couple of modern classic fast alphas, the 156 GTA and 147 GTA. I've done videos on both these cars, well, normal ones rather than GTAs, but still. I'll put a card in the corner linking to the 147 video if you fancy taking a peek. Both these cars feature the utterly sonorous Busso V6 at 3.2 litres producing 250 brake horsepower. These two cars both won European Car of the Year when they were launched, and when a Busso, one of the greatest sounding engines of all time, was crammed under their bonnets, they became fire breathers. While they lacked limited slip differentials, which made the power delivery interesting, these are legends of my childhood. Even in their standard forms, they handled so tightly and looked so good that I could not get enough. Even my dad's four-cylinder 147 felt special. Both these cars have been improved with a Q2 differential, finally allowing out the potential of their V6s and producing two of the best handling front-drive cars of their era. Falling further down the hole of sporting front-drive Italian sports cars, we're moving back over to Hall 5 and this 1983 Lancia Beta Coupe. The Beta range was huge, as it was the first Lancia designed under the watchful eye of Fiat, it's likely that they wanted to use this platform to its fullest extent, producing sporting models that had very little visual relationship to the saloons. But that's a good thing, and it's what makes the coupe so much more than a swoopier saloon car with fewer doors. 
But the beta range thankfully has never been dismissed as a watered down Lancia thanks to Fiat's intervention. All these cars benefited from Fiat's know-how, among the best in the world in the late 60s. In fact, all beaters had twin camshafts, 5-speed gearboxes, completely independent suspension and disc brakes on all four corners. Moving back a decade to the Beta Coupe's predecessor, this 1970 Lancia Fulvia Coupe. And it's the hot one, a Rally 1.6 HF. Apart from the Delta, predictably, the Fulvia Coupe is the Lancia I love most. It's supremely elegant in its sportiness, so much so that the only real sporting touch I can pin down is the shark nose front end so low that you can't see the grille or headlamps from standing height. Much like the Beta range, the Fulvia Saloon looked completely different to a coupe like this, or the even prettier Zagato-built Fulvia Sport. What pulls this HF away from the standard coupe are the wheel arch extensions and the much wider alloy wheels that complement the 1600cc V4, making the Fulvia one member of Lancia's long line of iconic rally cars. Another successful late 60s, early 70s rally car is the Alpine A110, and this example is fully kitted up for action with extra fog lamps, a big exhaust and huge mud flaps. The A110 was the first world rally champion in 1973, by which point the car had already been about for 10 years, but the car was continuously updated, bolstered by Renault's money after they bought Alpine outright in 1971. Its continued success until the next generation of rally specials, such as the Lancia Stratos, came about, is testament to how exceptionally well engineered the A110 was, especially considering its simple on paper mechanicals and rear engine layout. Every time I see an original A110, I forget just how small they really are. Only 750 kilograms and 113 centimeters tall. Alongside the original, we're lucky enough to have a modern Alpine, a car that I feel perfectly captures the essence of the original in a more well-rounded manner. In fact, despite its four-cylinder engine and automatic-only gearbox, I'd have one of these over a Cayman. Sticking with Renault, back across a couple of halls is the main Renault stand, featuring two subsequent high-spec Super Minis, this Renault 5 and its successor, the Renault Clio. These are here to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Clio, and this Clio is an early one, so early in fact that it retains the older ribbed Renault badge. The R5 we see here is the second generation or Super Sank, and though it's styled to resemble the original, it bears no direct mechanical relation. In fact, the original had a longitudinal engine and torsion bars at the front, based on the platform of the Renault 4. The 1984 vintage Super Sank finally switched to a transverse engine and struts at the front, based on the design of the Renault 9. The Clio carries on this concept, sharing the floor pan and suspension and making the Super Sank and Clio much more closely related than the original R5 and the Super. Though I've always had an enormous soft spot for Renaults, my mainstream French allegiance has gradually drifted over to Peugeot, and the lion badged car I want most of all is a Phase 1 Peugeot 306 GTI 6, just like this one. From the launch of the 205 in 1983, Peugeot stuck to that car's styling themes when developing new compact cars over the following decade, including the 106 in 1991 and larger 306 in 93. For me, the 306 is the ultimate form of these styling themes. For a small family car, it's just gorgeous. Every line is so carefully crafted and placed that I've only ever heard universal acclaim for its styling. In addition to that, the 306's suspension was both comfy and incredibly capable, making it by far and away the best driving car in the class, especially when competing with the poor Mark V Escort and dull Mark III Golf. Nobody else could compete when it came to hot hatches either, with the GTI 6's 2-litre engine producing nearly 170 brake horsepower and being coupled to a 6-speed manual, hence the 6 nomenclature. Alongside the 306 is another 
excellent early 90s Peugeot, and it's one that we didn't get in the UK, a 405 T16. The 405 is another fantastically good looking car, this one penned by Pininfarina, and the T16 is the left hand drive only top spec performance model. A homologation special with the same 2 litre engine as the 306 we've just seen, but with a turbocharger, producing 220 horsepower and sent to the roads through a four wheel drive system. Both the 306 and 406 were not just manufactured in France, but the UK as well at Wrighton on Dunsmore, a former factory of the Roots Group, who became Chrysler Europe and then Talbot once Peugeot took over. But before all that, the group had one particular Scottish built car that now has a massive cult following, the Hillman Imp. The Imp Club is embracing that cult following, with every car modified to their owner's personal tastes. I'd love an Imp. They're tiny, slightly odd and very fun. Three things I hold dear in a car. This red martini liveried car has belonged to its current owner for 14 years, and it was his first car. It's been treated to all the best cosmetic imp mods, including big arches, front and rear spoilers, and ridiculously wide 8x13 inch wheels. It's also been bored out to 903cc, with ITBs that bring the power output up to 65 brake horsepower. Oh, and it's got air suspension. If that's not enough though, this M-Reg Imp has a BMW K1200 engine in the back of it, making 130 brake horsepower. It also has gas suspension and poly bushes to firm up the handling, with a completely fresh braking system, including discs on the front to get it to stop. In short, Imps are cool. Keeping it roots, we're moving on to something from the same era as the Imps, but with a much more acceptable mechanical setup, and in this example, a much more conservative spec, with this Hillman Superminx Estate. It is still on mini lights though, and they suit the car perfectly, especially thanks to this shade of green. I'm a huge fan of Roots styling from the 50s and 60s, heavily influenced by the American motor industry and the work of Raymond Lowy. The Super Minx sat in the segment above the standard Audax style Hillman Minx, giving Roots some presence in what became the Cortina segment later in the decade. But I think these are much better looking than the Mark I Cortina. Oh, and estate cars are the best cars. By the mid 60s however, the Super Minx was already looking dated, only a few years after its introduction, and it was replaced by the car just to its right. This is what's known as a Roots Arrow, and badged up depending on trim and engines. This car being a basic one is a Hillman Minx, though the most common way people remember these cars are as the mid-spec model, the Hillman Hunter. The Arrow series was the last car designed wholly by Roots before Chrysler took over the following year in 1967, and visually it is scarily similar to the Mark II Cortina launched at the same time in 1966. Though the Arrow was developed with very little money and from lots of existing componentry, it lasted an extraordinarily long time, much longer than the Cortina until 1979. Even with the use of existing componentry, they managed to make the Arrow look completely fresh when compared to the old Super Minx, thanks to a few cosmetic features. The glass is curved and the bonnet line is much lower removing the tendency for Roots cars to look very upright, thanks to the canting over of the existing four-cylinder engine by 15 degrees. A similar trick was used over at General Motors in cars like this amazing Vauxhall Chevette HSR, the fire-breathing ultimate form of Vauxhall's first hatchback and the British translation of the Opel Cadet C. Under the bonnet of this completely radical Chevette is a 2.3 litre, 16 valve 4 cylinder, canted over at 45 degrees and producing 135 brake horsepower, allowing this homologation special to reach 60 miles per hour in less than 9 seconds. For me, the HSR completely annihilates the competition in desirability not just due to the good looks of the basic car, but the extent to which Vauxhall made it so different to any other Chevette. 
The huge body kit, wide wheels and daring graphics make it look completely modified, but this was Vauxhall at its very best, just as it began to really force an all-out assault on Ford's market leadership through the following decade. The Chevette range was replaced really by two cars, and expanding downwards right to the centre of the super mini market in 1983 was the Vauxhall Nova, and this one is the warmed over Nova SR. While this car couldn't directly compete with the likes of Ford and Austin in terms of sales, it opened up a whole new market for Vauxhall, and the Nova very quickly became the go-to choice of youth and enthusiasts, modifying their Novas to win an inch of their lives, especially the SRs and GSIs. From standard, Nova SRs came with frankly brilliant charcoal coloured wheel trims, but an optional extra ticked on this car with the three-spoke GSI alloys, making this completely identical to the Nova my dad had when he was my age in the early 1990s. He was cooler at age 21 than I am. What are cooler than three-spoke alloys, however, are lattice alloys, and when they're bolted to a Rover SD1, they're about as cool as they can get. This isn't any old SD1 either, it's the fully-fledged Rover Vitesse, meaning it's driven by a 3.5 litre fuel-injected variant of the iconic Rover V8. Considering that this is a 1984 car, by which point the ST1 was nearly a decade old and competing with an influx of BMWs, including the fabulous E28 5 Series, it's amazing how fresh Austin Rover managed to keep it looking. The vibrant paintwork, wheels, rear wing and deep front bumper make the Vitesse so much more extroverted than any German competitor, and it had a full 8 cylinders to offer. A British car with even more pops in its power plant will be our final car for our look around the show. And what a way to end with this 5.3 litre, 12 cylinder Jaguar XJS. For some reason, this is the car I think of when I hear the words Grand Tourer. And it's a car that gets better every time you look at it. While a sizeable proportion of people weren't so fond of its styling in 1975, I can guarantee that the majority now believe that the XJS is a stunning bit of car design. Its sheer size despite its low roofline makes it incredibly graceful, with its long bonnet, characterful headlamps and famous buttresses somehow epitomising everything that makes a Jaguar a Jaguar. This car is a relatively early one, built in 1979, only four years into a 21 year production run, and I feel that gives us a much more relative view of the period the car was designed in. The chrome detailing, impact bumpers and wheel design all indicate just how sleek and different this car must have looked when it was launched the best part of 50 years ago. And that concludes our three part look around the classic motor show. I wasn't planning on doing three parts, but even while trying to limit the number of cars I filmed, I still had enough for well over an hour of footage. And that's testament to how wonderful large car shows can be. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, and if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.